I went to summer camp a few times when I was a Boy Scout. It was usually pretty fun, especially the parts of the day we got to spend doing whatever we wanted. Nobody was actually invested in earning new merit badges, unless it was for something cool like wakeboarding. All we really cared about was messing around in the woods and swimming in the springs to beat the heat. It was a nice time just to be away from home and our parents for a week, and the only thing a Boy Scout was missing was a girl to gall cat. In the beginning, I thought I would go to summer camp every year if I could. However, things took a turn when I was 14 years old. After this trip, I left my troop and I never went camping again. It was on the fourth day of summer camp, right in the middle of everything. As far as responsibilities were concerned, it was a light day for me and my friends, four of us in all. We ran around the main common area of the campgrounds, used our allowances to buy ourselves each a souvenir knife at the general store, drank some yoo-hoos, and threw some tomahawks with the weapons guy between his classes. Eventually, two of us decided that we were getting tired and sweaty and just wanted to sit around in our tents until dinner time. But my closer friend, Joshua, and I wanted to keep it going. There was a network of trails that snaked all around the various campsites. We'd already taken the trail to the springs, so Josh and I wanted to do a little more exploration. There were two of us, and we both had canteens full of water and snacks in our pockets, along with knives and cordage, a map, and a compass. And I had a small first aid kit, so we thought we were prepared for whatever we would run into out there. We didn't plan on going far either, since we had to be back in a little under three hours for dinner. We set out from our troops campsite with plenty of daylight left, and we made our way into a mosquito-infested area of woods. The canopy shaded us pretty well, but the air was humid and stifling. We wanted to see what it was like out there, but all we discovered was that the trees were a bit taller. It wasn't long before we started to make conversation over the sound of afternoon bugs. The sort of bonding you would expect to occur between two 14-year-olds in the woods. We talked about girls mostly, and the ones that we thought were ugly, so on and so forth. None of it was very tasteful, admittedly. We jokingly proposed it was possible for us to go far enough that we would find our way into the Girl Scout section of the campgrounds, which did exist, but it was well separated from the boys. Around then is when our surroundings started to change inexplicably. Suddenly, there was a breeze, washing away the warm blanket of moist, motionless air and replacing it with cool, dry wind. Initially, this came as a great relief to me and Josh, who had been sweating profusely for hours, even in the shade. It also seemed to drive away all the mosquitoes and gnats, which was a welcome bonus. But just a few moments later, the woods quickly darkened and the sky above us between the branches of the canopy went from vibrant blue to a pale gray. Hey, Josh, I said, concerned. I think it's about to rain. No kidding, he agreed. More like we're about to get caught up in a thunderstorm. Should we turn back, I suggested. No, Joshua replied with confidence, looking down at his compass. The trail that we're on loops back to camp. Right now we're heading due north, which means we're right in the middle. We might as well just keep going. Well, sure. All right, then, I said. Josh seemed to be pretty confident about his navigation skills, so I let him make the decision to press on. However, the threat of being soaked to the bone put a damper on the mood, and as such, there was a lull in the conversation. We hiked on, listening for oncoming thunder and waiting to feel the first raindrops land on our heads. Except, they never came. The darkness that descended on us only increased, but rain never fell. Hey, Josh, I said again, even more concerned this time. Will you check the time, man? I think we might have missed dinner. Josh looked down at his watch. No way, man, we've only been hiking for... And then suddenly, Joshua went silent and stopped in his tracks. What is it, man? I asked. My watch is dead, he said gravely. It's dead? How is that possible? I thought you replaced the battery before going to camp. Shh. Joshua silenced me and started looking all around. Do you hear that? He whispered. I listened, but I didn't hear anything. 
Actually, I heard so much of nothing that it struck fear into my heart. It was totally silent. Not a sound in the woods all around us. It was an unnatural quiet, devoid of any cicadas or even flies. For a minute, I peered deeper and deeper into the woods with my ears and heard only silence. Until finally, I heard singing. Angelic singing. But it was so soft and quiet that it was almost inaudible. But unmistakingly, the voice of a beautiful woman. Just by the way that Josh looked at me in that moment, wide-eyed and grinning, I knew he heard it too. Oh, it's the Girl Scouts, he exclaimed. Then before I could even respond, he bolted into the woods to go after the sound. Wait, Josh, stop. I started to go with him, but by the time I had taken ten steps off the trail, I realized I couldn't see well enough to go any farther. It was like the sky had fallen. Darkness like the dead of midnight had snuffed out the light of day in merely a moment. A deep sense of dread filled my body, telling me to turn back. I backtracked the ten steps I had taken without even turning around until I felt the flatness of the trail beneath my shoe again. At this point, all I could hear is my own breathing and heartbeat, and the singing of whoever was in the woods growing louder and drawing near. But something was wrong. The sound no longer came from a single direction. Somehow it was circling all around me, closing in on me. It was too loud to bear, and it felt like it was putting physical pressure on my body. I tried to cover my ears, but it was just useless. It all became a single piercing cry. Finally, I heard a scream. It was a boy's scream. It cut through the cacophony and returned my surroundings to total silence, except for the echo of someone's cry for help. Josh, I called into the woods. Come back. There was no reply. A moment later, I heard a twig snap on the trail from the direction we'd just come from. I hoped to see Joshua, but I didn't. There was an inhumane figure at the nearest bend in the trail, the shape of a tall woman, but composed of no flesh or bone whatsoever, only ominous light. As I gazed upon whatever spirit this was, it suddenly raced towards me. What I did next was pure instinct. I abandoned Josh and ran blindly down the trail as quickly as my body could take me, and I didn't stop until I spilled out into the campsite again, collapsing to the ground. When I looked up, I saw that everything was different. The sun was shining, the woods were alive with birds and bugs. All of my friends were coming to see what was wrong with me, why I was so upset and panicky, but I couldn't speak a word for hours. When I could finally tell the scoutmasters what happened, they didn't believe me. They sent a search party for Josh, but they couldn't find a single trace of him. Even the police were never able to locate him. He simply vanished. Suspicion eventually turned to me because of the story I told was so unbelievable. So to avoid being put in an asylum, I ended up changing my official statement to losing track of him when we both went to take a piss at separate trees. And that I turned my back for just a minute, and then he was gone. And in my worry and panic, I thought I saw something that wasn't there. But it's all lies, because I know what happened. But in the years that have passed since then, not a single person has believed me. A few months ago, during spring break, I sent a story to Rip Shar that happened between a friend of mine named Allison and her creepy ex-boyfriend, Josh. There's now a part two to this story. It was around five o'clock in the morning at our friend group's usual hangout spot. Josh randomly appeared and convinced Allison to get a ride home from him, rather than sleeping the alcohol off in her car. And unsurprisingly, this case was a ruse to basically kidnap her and do God knows what. I was the only one around at the time, and out of suspicion, I followed them in my car and I managed to stop whatever it was from happening. A lot of the comments on that video rightfully said that if I was her friend, I never should have let her get in the car with him. And that's true. Some people even said I was somehow a creep for harboring feelings and trying to be some kind of white knight. But in all honesty, I just want to look out for the people I care about. Unfortunately, what went down last spring break was only a prelude to what has occurred this last week during the summer. It's almost August at the time of writing this, and Allison has been back in town since June. 
Nobody had seen Josh, her clingy and mentally unstable ex, since the whole attempted kidnapping thing. The owner of the establishment we frequent made it clear to all of us that Josh was trespassed from the premises, which helped Allison feel a little safer. However, when somebody is seriously obsessed, and when their obsession is combined with drug abuse, they will sometimes find whatever way they can to push the boundaries, and then eventually cross them. This is the case with Josh. Nobody even mentioned him all summer, until recently. His name started to go around in whispers like a ghost. Friends of ours were sure that they'd seen him lurking in the shadows of the parking lot, but when they went out to look again, nobody was there. I had a feeling that something was up, but I didn't quite trust my gut. A few nights ago, a group of us were hanging out after hours at the bar. Four or five of us in total, including the owner. I ran out of cigarettes, but I remembered that I had another pack in my car, so I ran out to get some. As per after hours protocol, the door was locked behind me until I came back. It was a little after three in the morning. I recognized every car in the parking lot as my friends, so I was pretty sure everything was safe. I got to my car and opened the door to reach into my cup holder for the pack of cigarettes, but right as I leaned in, I felt somebody push me. I quickly got out of my car and looked back at whoever it was, and to my astonishment, it was Josh. Looking more gaunt and cracked out ever than before. He was up on my face and he had me cornered in the crook of my car door. Hey punk, it's been a while hasn't it? He shouted. You were in there with Allison I'm assuming. Getting all nice and cozy with her, huh? He pointed at the bar, which was also where Allison had parked. Oh let me guess, you're banging her in the parking lot. Coming to grab some condoms? I could tell Josh was off of something based on how fast he was talking, which only meant he was more unstable than usual. No way man, not at all. I put my hands up and surrender. I'm just coming to grab some cigarettes, man. See? I then showed him the pack in my hand. Instantly, he swatted it out of my grasp and sent it into the nearby ditch. Don't lie to me, Spencer. He hissed. I know you've been trying to get in her pants for months. You got everybody to take your side against me. That's not it at all, man, I swear. I got a girlfriend now. I knew it. She left me for you. Josh was screaming loudly now. The spit was spewing in my face. I sank backwards, halfway into my car. I was cornered and running out of ways to talk myself out of the situation, if it was even possible. Unfortunately, I was wasted and I didn't have any tact. So I pushed him so I could have at least a few feet between the two of us. Get it through your head, man. She's just not into you. I don't even think she's into dudes at all. I knew that would more than likely set him off, and it did. He screamed something unintelligible and reached for me, but I managed to jump back into my car and slam the door shut before he could get to me. Right then, he screamed in pain and I realized his finger got jammed into the door. He pulled it open to free himself, but I immediately pulled back with both hands and locked the door. In his pain and rage, Josh started to break the window and threatened me through the glass, so I pulled out my phone and called the owner of the bar. We've got a Josh situation. I said with all seriousness. Please tell me you're joking, he replied. No, I'm not. He's literally in the parking lot right now and acting crazy. The owner sighed quickly and swore. Shit, she just went to her car. No way, I muttered in disbelief as I watched Josh suddenly bolt from my back door toward the bar. I jumped out of the car and raced toward him, trying to catch up before he reached Allison, who had just rounded the corner. The look on her face said it all. As soon as she saw Josh running at her, she turned right the hell around. Unfortunately, I couldn't catch up with Josh. He had a head start and a bunch of coke in his system to gas him up. But thankfully, by the time I got to the back door, he was already there banging on it to get in. His finger was gashed open and smearing blood everywhere, and he barely even noticed me standing there. Allison, he kept screaming, please just come out so we can talk. Of course, I knew all Allison could hear was a psychotic banging on the metal door, and I seriously doubted that talking was all he wanted to do. I was pretty stunned by the whole situation, so for a moment, all I did was watch this pitiful and scary display of desperation play out. I honestly didn't know what I could do, but then I didn't have to do much. Suddenly the door unlocked and flew open, hitting Josh right in the face. 
He stumbled backward, groaning in pain, and holding his nose as the owner stepped out to push him away and tell him off. Get out of here, man. You're banned. If you come back again, I'm calling the cops. Behind the owner, a friend of mine was inside, waving me in. I silently followed and stepped in. The last thing I saw was Josh sauntering off with a bloody nose before the door closed. I can't blame Allison for being pretty shook up about the whole thing. I mean, just imagine you step outside to go sleep in your car. And the first thing you see is a crazy person that's obsessed with you, sprinting right at you. As time went on, the Josh sightings haven't stopped. Every time, it's from somebody walking alone through the parking lot when it's late and dark. And he's always lurking just out of sight, darting away the moment he's noticed. Our friends no longer let Allison go out to her car by herself, and she's been spending more time at home. But I think this is honestly getting ridiculous. It's time for stalking charges or a restraining order. Or maybe it's time for all of us to be 100% real and actually just stomp this guy out when he steps out of line. Because clearly, a cracked nail and a broken nose wasn't enough warning. But I don't know. I guess I'm all talk. When I was in middle school, I was desperate for friends. I tried to talk to anyone that let me sit with them, but nobody ever seemed to like me enough to keep me around, or they would just be mean to me. That's why when the two prettiest, most popular girls in school, Caitlin and Emily, invited me to a sleepover with them, I was thrilled. I tried sitting with them at lunch a few times before, but they always told me to go away because they were busy talking about something that wasn't my business. But then, on the last day of school one year, they both came up to me while I was sitting by myself and said they really wanted to hang out with me over the summer, but they didn't want other people to see us hanging out together while we were still in school. Even as a naive and lonely middle schooler, I knew that was a severely underhanded invite, but I accepted it with enthusiasm anyway. I would take what I could get, and they knew it. Of course my mom was just glad I was finally started to hang out with other kids, and she gladly gave me permission to go. Especially when I said that Caitlin's mom offered to serve all three of us dinner. When I got there, it was about 8pm, and I was already dressed in my pajamas. But Emily and Caitlin were still fully dressed. When I asked if we were still going to have dinner together, Caitlin said that they had just finished eating right before I got there. Then Emily said I didn't need to eat so much anyway. They were already putting me down, but I wanted to be friends with them so badly that I let them do it. After I said hi to Caitlin's mom, who was already wine drunk and ready for us to not be her problem anymore, we all went up to Caitlin's room upstairs. It was a Jack and Jill style bedroom, with her own bathroom and another bedroom on the other side. I asked Caitlin who was in the other room, but she snapped at me and said it was her older sister, then told me to not be so nosy. I apologized profusely that just told me to be quiet because my voice was annoying. Caitlin had a bunch of awesome stuff in her room, from Taylor Swift posters to expensive makeup and giant stuffed animals. All sorts of stuff that my mom couldn't afford to get me. But as much as I wanted to ask her about it, I knew she wouldn't like that, so I just looked at the floor. We started to play Truth or Dare, which Emily and Caitlin used to mine all sorts of information about me, including who I had a crush on and how much money my parents made. I told them everything honestly, only for them to laugh in my face every time. Whenever I asked them to tell the truth about something, they made up a bunch of ridiculous stuff that I knew was a lie. But of course, I wasn't going to call them out on it. When I finally got sick and tired of having to spill all my beans, I told them to dare me to do something. As soon as I said that, Emily and Caitlin looked at each other with the most wicked smiles. Like they had been waiting for me to say that the whole time. Then, Caitlin dared me to go into the bathroom and play the Bloody Mary game. I didn't know what it was at the time, and when I admitted this, they both screamed in disbelief that I didn't know who Bloody Mary was. They explained it to me, and they said I had to do it or I would have to leave the sleepover. I wanted to stay, so I stepped inside the bathroom. Caitlin and Emily lit a candle in front of the mirror. Then they turned off the lights and shut the door. You have to say it loud and clear. Caitlin teased me from the other side. If you don't, we'll know. I was shaking. I had no idea what would happen. Was this Bloody Mary someone that could really be summoned? Would she really kill me if she came? I really didn't know, but 
The only thing that pushed me forward was the need to be accepted and the belief that things like ghosts didn't exist. I looked at myself in the mirror, then took a deep breath and said, Bloody Mary, three times slowly. For a moment, nothing happened. I looked behind my reflection and there was nothing. Until I saw a woman crawling out of the bathtub behind me. I screamed and turned around and I realized it was real. There was a real bloody woman standing in the shower. Her skin was gray like she was dead and her clothes were torn up, but her eyes were open and she was looking right at me. Slowly, the woman stepped out of the tub and started walking toward me. I was so petrified I couldn't move. I wanted to, but it was like my legs had turned to stone. With every step that she took, she left a trail of blood. Soon, she was right in front of me. I screamed again, but she grabbed me by the throat and lifted me up to my tiptoes. She opened her mouth and revealed a gaping jaw full of blood and blackness, inching toward my neck like she was going to take a bite out of it. I couldn't maintain control of myself, so in that moment, I peed my pants. But then, at the last second, the door swung open and the lights turned on. What's going on in here? Caitlin asked. Why are you screaming? I could barely get a word out through my stuttering teeth but I managed what I could. Bloody Mary was here, I said. She was right in front of me. I saw her and it was real. She grabbed me and everything and she tried to kill me. What? Emily and Caitlin said at the same time. They looked all around the bathroom, but of course, she was gone. Stop acting crazy, said Emily. You're just begging for attention. Honestly, it's kind of embarrassing. Caitlin snickered and agreed. You wait, did you pee yourself? That's disgusting. Oh my god. So yeah, actually, I think if you're going to act like that, you just have to leave. What? Why? I asked in disbelief. But before I knew it, Caitlin and Emily dragged me out of the bathroom and pushed me down the stairs, then threw all my stuff down at me. I crawled to Caitlin's mother as a sobbing mess, and I begged her to call my mom. Based on the look in her eyes and the way she sighed, I think she was very close to just letting me cry myself to sleep on the ground. But thankfully, she had the basic decency to call my mother so I could get out of that awful house. I never fully explained to my mother what happened, except for the fact that they were so mean that I cried. I hid the bruises from being pushed down the steps, and I wore turtlenecks through the next few weeks to hide the bruises on my neck. That was how my summer vacation began that year. Needless to say, I never left the house again until school was back in session. As for Bloody Mary, Caitlin and Emily's gaslighting was so effective on me that I honestly believe she existed for over two years after that. Until one day I told this story to my first real friend in high school, and they explained to me the obvious truth, that it was just Caitlin's older sister in a convincing costume.